today we're going to be talking about IPOs. And I guess before we even get started, got to read a quick risk statement, not financial advice, educational purposes only. Not financial advice, not investment advice. We do not know your preferences. We do not know your financial situation. Please use this for educational purposes only. All right, let's get started. So we're going to be having a two-part lesson. So this is the first part today. The second part is going to be in the second half of the year. And essentially, I know a lot of people at United Traders are TA specialists with a, particularly a lot of futures trading and, I guess, momentum trading, right? Hopefully, these lessons will expand your toolkit to be able to trade around fundamentals. And so really to, you know, lay this out for you, we really have to build a foundation and start at the very beginning. So today we're going to be talking about how equity capital markets operate. So if you don't even know what a stock is or how it works, we're going to explain that. We're going to talk about the different market participants, and then we're going to go into IPOs. And I think it's a timely lesson since, you know, the IPO window is opening back up again. We had ARM come out in September, Instacart, Birkenstock. So they're slowly coming out. And, you know, if the market stays high, there will be a lot, a lot more coming. And it's good to understand the mechanics behind them, how you can trade them, how you can monetize them. So to get started, you know, to just really frame the discussion, what we're going to cover, right, is the different players. And there is a game theory aspect to it. So we're going to focus on incentives as well, because in an IPO, there's usually actually, you know, a few key players that can have a major impact, right, on both the pricing, how the IPO trades, and the overall narrative. So we're going to highlight that. We're going to talk about price manipulation in IPOs. It is actually legal for an investment bank to stabilize the price of an IPO. And we're going to discuss the mechanics of that and how you can capitalize on that yourself. Another question that comes up often is, you know, an IPO is priced at a certain dollar amount and it typically ends up opening at a significantly higher price. So I'll explain why. Right. If you traded Airbnb, for example, that was a pretty popular one. Airbnb priced at $65 and it opened at $147. So I'll explain, you know, what that gap is and why it is there. Um, and most importantly, right, what we want to answer, is there any upside in IPOs for us? And as a spoiler alert, there isn't much for, for the you know retail investor, but we are UT and we are going to figure out how to make money on it. So before we jump in, um, you know, just an anecdotal story, right? This is a person that I don't personally know, but, you know, I've talked to people on these teams at hedge funds that invest in IPOs and it's an interesting proposition, right? So you have this person here who worked for Morgan Stanley, which is an investment bank. They're the number one equity capital markets investment bank in the world he grinded his way up he worked 100 hour weeks year after year and to do what in order to go to a hedge fund to invest in ipos right so what's interesting is that this guy you know quit the you know number one bank at a time when you know april 2021 when ipos were at their peak because he thought he could make more money investing in IPOs than actually, you know, being the middleman in these IPOs. So ask yourself, right, you know, why, why, why was, you know, why is the compensation investing in IPOs so much higher? And number two, after this guy gets paid, how much is left for you? So, you know, we're going to start at the foundation, as I said, where we're going to really, you know, go block by block and kind of understand the different components, right, of the equity markets, right? So if I run a private company, 
and I want to take it public, right? What do I need, right? And you know, one example would be investors, right? You need someone to buy your stock. You also need to register with the SEC, right? And make sure that you're fairly disseminating information to investors. You need shares, which are going to pay, you know, investors by a capital appreciation, buybacks, right? When the company gets acquired, you're going to get a payoff. You're going to get money through dividends, right? So there's going to be an appeal, but these shares need a price, right? And someone needs to assign a dollar value to that share and we need to agree on it or else there's no market, right? So there also has to be a market and a middleman that's going to trade those shares. And finally, right, there has to be some marketing because if no one knows these shares exist, then no one is going to buy them. And then after the company goes public, there are even more things that the company has to do. It has to make sure that investors to, or employees or people with insider information do not trade, you know, that stock and, you know, capitalize on insider information that again, have to make sure that information is fairly distributed on market participants. And they have to, you know, make sure, manage expectations because they want the stock to go up. And so does anyone know what department at a company is responsible for managing the company's stock? Does anyone know? Okay. Not hearing anything. <laughs> so the name of that department and you've heard of it before oh we had a chat message i'm not sure okay so the name of that department is called investor relations right it's literally a team whose full-time job is to make sure that the stock goes up so we're gonna in the little second lesson we're gonna talk about you know what that entails the other aspect, which is important to mention, right, is when you're a public company, you now have to answer to a shareholder base that you don't control, right? If you're a private company, you get to pick and choose who your investors are. If you're a public company, it can literally be anyone, right? So there are hedge funds that invest in companies, get a board seat, and then look to, you know, change how these companies are managed, right? So, you know, these are all major issues and you know tasks i guess that companies have to you know follow or execute right when they go public so it's a lot of work but it is worth it and you know there's a several reasons why uh companies do this right so first of all so that they can you know raise money and in one way it's preferable to raising debt because you don't pay an interest and there's no rules, right, or covenants, right, that you have to follow. So it's less restrictive. Um, once you're public, it's easier to raise even more money, right, because now you have a publicly traded stock and you can just make more out of it and, you know, raise money that way. You're also able to compensate your employees, right? You can, again, create essentially shares out of thin air and give them to your employees, right? And you know, that's a that's an expense, right, that a company can have. And, you know, then they're more invested, right, in the success of the company. They can also do, uh, go, right, go public to reward their investors, right? So whoever, you know, invested in the company when it went private can potentially cash out during the IPO. And, you know, their investment becomes more liquid. The other aspect, of it is the branding, right? So, you know, a lot of people probably only heard of ARM after their IPO, right? And in fact, I challenge you to name what's the number one private company in the world by revenues. I don't think anyone knows what it is. Does anyone know? Does anyone know what the number one private company is? Probably not. I'm going to jump the gun here. Probably not. I didn't either. It turns out it's Cargill with $115 billion in revenue, right? And no one knows about it. And, 
I think the reason why is because it's not a public company, right? So there absolutely is a brand aspect, right, to uh, being a public company. And so who's going to help with going public? Typically, it's going to be the investment bank, and they are going to, you know, provide an end-to-end service, essentially, in this regard, right? So they have clients, right, lots of wealthy clients, institutions, that can invest in your company. They have a trading desk that's going to be able to make the market right in the shares that you're going to offer. They're going to have a research department that's going to be able to package up your clients, right? The company that's going public, their information and disseminate that to investors and essentially, right? Make the stock more appealing. And, you know, a good example of this would be, right? If I had a lemonade stand and I say, it's worth twenty dollars. You know, you're you're gonna be like, all right, well, I I don't know if it's worth twenty dollars, right? You're not gonna be very confident, right? But if Goldman Sachs says Mark's lemonade stand is worth twenty dollars, you're probably gonna be more willing to pay twenty dollars, right, to buy my lemonade stand. So it it is really a marketing aspect there. There's the you know, I guess the valuation, uh, which I guess, falls into the example that I just gave. And then also just the timing, right? Um, You know, they have their ear to the markets, right? They know what clients would potentially be willing to invest in. So it is a valuable, um, you know, advisory service that these investment banks provide. And just to, you know, show you the broader picture, right? You know, if we look at JP Morgan, their investment bank is around 30% of the revenues and you know, you have equity markets hired there, which is right where essentially right this IPO and fall on machine kind of sits. And really to just map out these key components and it's worth the time to do it because um, you know, it, it, it helps explain, right, the equity capital markets ecosystem, right? And it's not a complex, it looks complex, but it's not that complex, right? So if we started the company, right, this is the client, this is the company going public, they're going to work with the investment bank, right, in order to become a public company and issue their shares. In order to manage their stock, right, their IR department is going to disseminate information in a controlled way, right, in a way where they're going to set expectations to a degree where, right, um, you know, this company can become a public company, and beat expectations, right? That's the key, right? Because if a if a company only performs the expectations, then its stock is not going to go up, right? And you're not going to want to invest in a company where expectations, right, you know, aren't being beat, right? Because then your capital is not going to appreciate. So the research department, right, it packages that information up, it sends it off, right, to investors, it sends it off to its sales force, and Salesforce, right, is essentially going to market this company's stock. And ideally, the investors will then trade, right, on that incremental information, or they'll become customers of the investment bank. And that's where the money is going to be made. So really, where the money is made is the trading and the investment banking, right? Not here. And if I go on to the next slide... Right. So, you know, just to recap, right, the role of research, right, they they work with the bankers to kind of help them understand the company that's going public from, you know, a public side view, right? Because bankers typically, right, or only, right, work in private markets, um, right? It helps the traders understand, you know, what's moving stocks, right? And, you know, makes markets more efficient in that regard, and it helps investors kind of tell them where to look, right? This is important. That is important. You know, this is what the stock is pricing. These are what the expectations are. And it is mainly, right, a marketing um, a marketing force, right? And the key point here is that their job is not to help you make money. Their job is to market the stock, right? And so... You know, if you're a retail trader with no exposure, right, to this industry, the way that you will see it is, right, you know, just like this, right? It'll be a headline of, you know, 
saying, you know, some investment bank like expects this stock to go up or, you know, this commodity to go up or thinks the market is going to go up and they're not pumping, right? They're not trying to, you know, inflate right the value of a stock. That's not their goal, right? So when you see here NVIDIA stock jumps 7% after Morgan Stanley, blah, blah, blah. You know, what, in, uh, what Morgan Stanley did, right, was they interviewed, you know, 100 NVIDIA customers, right, and they found some interesting information or they got, an ins- you know, a closer view, right, at NVIDIA's operations. They published that, which then, you know, is getting priced in in the market, right? Like, that's a very big move on a research report, right? And again, how does Morgan Stanley make money on this? It actually is made when someone you know, sees that, you know, NVIDIA moved 7% and then they want to see that research report. And if you want the report, you have to, you know, be a client of MS. And in fact, you know, MS owns E-Trade. So, you know, if you're a customer of E-Trade, you have access to Morgan Stanley's research and that that's how it works. And anecdotally, um, you know, the UK actually said, no, if you, People want research, right? They pay for research. They don't get it for free if they're clients of the bank. And what happened was actually, you know, a lot of comp- a lot of companies stopped going public in the UK. A lot of smaller companies, uh, you know, started to underperform from a stock standpoint just because, you know, the work was less efficient or, or um, you know, the information was less accessible, right, on those companies. And now they're rolling it back. So, you know, this is just an anecdotal um, piece of information just to say, right, you know, these banks absolutely do play a role in disseminating information and, you know, kind of driving the narrative in a stock. And so, right, to reiterate, right, these research departments, right, they actually are not profitable, right? They're a loss leader and they... Are, exist to right drive that business towards trading towards um you know taking companies public right that's where the money is and so you know this was the uber ipo uh, i believe back in 2019 right morgan stanley took home 40 million dollars right and you know uh, um it was probably a team of five to ten people that worked on that deal at morgan stanley right so when you think of it as you know revenue per head, right? That that's a pretty lucrative business, and it's typically a seven percent of the total amount raised that you know the banks will charge, and so you know that's typically um, you know that's a pretty sizable chunk, right? That they take. So if you have a uh, one billion dollar right valuation or one one billion dollars being raised they're going to take seven, 70 million of that and companies are willing to pay and so in fact like right um and you know a lot of investors right they really want access right to these ipos right like you have the hottest you have the arm ipo right it's the hottest ipo of the year and everyone is clamoring right to get you know a piece of it and usually it will go in priority, right, to some of the most high commission clients, right? People that trade with Morgan Stanley the most are going to be prioritized, right? So it, it enhances their revenues in that way. And then, you know, I talked about how it's legal for banks to stabilize prices. Um, this is where a lot of money can be made. And it's, it's, it's a very interesting part of the IPO process. Um, but that we'll get into later. But, you know, in this case on the, I believe it was the Uber IPO or the Facebook IPO, I forget which one, but, you know, Morgan Stanley essentially made 215 million in trading profits, right? And I'll explain how they did that. On a, as a side note, right? So you don't have to exclusively uh, work with an investment bank to go public, um, you can actually just go to, um, I guess, an exchange, right, and say, "Hey, I want my chair, my my shares, just to start trading in the open market, and let the market determine their pricing." 
And so here's a few tickers, right, that uh, went public via that method, right? So you just say, like, I have these existing shares. We're, they're going to start trading on the market. Whatever price the market gives them is what we'll take. And it's usually, you know, not to raise capital, right? Because first of all, there's no guarantee. Second of all, you're not creating new shares, essentially, right? So just a transfer of wealth, right, from or existing shareholders to new shareholders. But you're able to avoid, right, the fees that would go to the investment banks, right? So you could save probably that 50 million out of the 70 million, right, that you would hypothetically pay Morgan Stanley, right, on an IPO, and you're not creating new shares. So it this is interesting to keep an eye on. And I have it here as well, because this is a different playbook if, you know, it's a direct listing versus you know, an underwritten offering. So keep this in mind. It's you would trade this differently than you would a traditional IPO. And the second side note, right, is SPACs, you know, were a very popular way to go public back, right, in 2021, 2020. And we all traded them and we all had a lot of fun making and losing money on these SPACs. And it really was a you know a great way for companies to go public because there was a lot less scrutiny. It was faster, and that's kind of about where the benefits end. Because the tough part was right was that first of all there was a lot more dilution because the founder like Shamath would get twenty percent of the shares right in the SPAC for for doing absolutely nothing. So you know money would be going to him. You would still need uh right sponsors. These are the investment banks that you know kind of help you know take care of all the technical things in terms of you know setting up this investment vehicle, but they would collect the fee, right? And so they would also right get some shares and they would get warrants, right? Which when exercised, right, would give you shares and that would drive dilution. And what is interesting that ended up happening is right. So to set up this vehicle, right, it cost around $9 million. And if you don't close a deal, right, essentially all the investors get their money back, which is part of the appeal, but right. You lose these fees, right. That you paid to set this up. And so, you know, the wall street journal actually did the math and for all the SPACs that never merged, a cumulative 2 billion was lost, right? And what's interesting as well, right, is, right, these founders, right, they're getting a great deal because, you know, you're getting 20% of the ownership in the SPAC for doing absolutely nothing, but you have to hold it for 12 to 24 months, right? So Shamath was posting his multi-billion dollar gains at the end of December or December 2020, I remember that pretty vividly, that's circulating on Twitter. Turns out, right, th- you know, those were just paper gains, right? And in the end, he only, it's still one of the best trades of all time, but he made $750 million, right? Because there was a lockup. So when we get back to IPOs, right, it's important to kind of disseminate the key players, right, due to the you know different or the influence right someone just uh, i just see a question pop up someone asked about spacex so spacex so, so first of all i was saying largest private companies based on uh revenues right spacex probably in terms of valuation would be the largest or actually no i think spacex it's like it was like 150 billion last round um how much is research compensated in an ipo that is a great question. There, that is a great question. Maybe you can find the answer for me and come back. <laughs> All right, but let's get back. So, the, the there's a certain game theory aspect, right, to IPOs, and so it's important, right, to kind of go through the different players, right. So there's the hedge funds, right, which you know are very active traders. They move in and out very quickly, right. Citadel, Bridgewater, that's kind of the the most famous ones there there's the pension funds right the long onlys 
and they have a lower risk tolerance, but they also are less likely, right, to sell your stock, right? So there's a certain, you know, desirability, right, to have these log onlys invested in your IPO because you know that they won't sell. But you also need hedge funds, right, to create the liquidity for trading to actually take place, right? So there's a balance there. Sovereign wealth funds, it should be actually in the long only category, but um, yeah, there's a Saudi public investment fund. Then, you know, after, you know, all these different players are essentially satisfied, the broker will start calling up, you know, its favorite, you know, individual ultra high net worth clients saying, hey, how many shares in the ARM IPO do you want? Um, we might be able to give you some allocation. And then after, you know, satisfying all of these people, there might be just some shares left for us. And that's actually usually not a good thing. Um, you know, if TD Ameritrade is like offering you shares in an IPO, you usually don't want to take that because that means there is not a significant amount of demand otherwise they would probably not offer it to someone that pays a few hundred dollars in commissions every year um and so we, we kind of you know split up these two sides right the banks and the investors right which in you know finance terminology would be the buy side and the sell side and you can think of it in a different way as well, right? You can categorize the, you know, various types of investors based on their goals, right? People that are, you know, buying something for its fundamental value, um, arbitragers who are essentially the market makers, right? They're making more markets more efficient. There's the gamblers, which is, you know, a lot of people on United Traders that are just buying it just to sell it. Um without any idea of what a company does or how it's valued. There's the index investors, right? That just like Uber just got added into the S&P 500, right? It's gonna, um, you know, as a result right now, there's gonna be index allocation, right? To Uber. And so to, you know, turn the focus back on IPOs, right? This is really the key to it all, right? So, you know, if you ask bankers and you ask company executives, ideally they want to see an IPO share price go up between 15 and 30% on the day, right? And by that, I mean, not from open to close, but from where the IPO is priced to where the stock closes on the day. And that's a very important difference, right? Because the offer price, right? Which is where the IPO is priced, right? That's what we have access to, right? When Airbnb started trading at 147, that's the price that we get. The investors, the price that they got was $65, right? So that's a very big difference. And, that's, and we're gonna talk about why that difference is there. And, you know, what, how, how significant that is, right, in terms of investing. So, you know, the chart below, um, you can kind of see, right, uh, the blue line. It's actually on the right axis. Those should be percentages, um, right? That's the average first day return. You can see it's pretty consistently, right, in the double digits, um, but it tends to, go even higher, right, in, you know, bull markets, in melt-ups, I guess you could say. And there's another term, it's called money left on the table, right? And again, this is going back to this dual mandate, right? So they want it to be up 15 to 30% because they want to reward investors, right, that invest in IPO by giving them that 15 to 30% quick gain. But on the other side of the table, right, is the company that raised money, right? And they're going to say, well, you know, we, you know, Airbnb is going to say, look, like, you told us our company was worth $65 a share. We got money, right, in accordance to that valuation. It's not trading at $140 a share. Like, you, you know, we could have raised a lot, a lot more money or gave away a lot less of the company, right, to get to raise the same amount of money, right? So 
it has to, you know, 15 and 30, that's kind of that sweet spot where the company won't be mad and the investors won't be mad. And they need to satisfy both or else this is not, uh, you know, a sustainable business, right? Because, you know, tech, essentially, right, everyone wants needs to win, right? And maybe everyone except for the retail traders, but that's pretty much the gist of it. And so, right, if, if you know, I'm a retail trader and I trade from the opening price, it's a coin flip, right? Whether we end up or down and, you know, from a return standpoint, right? Um, if I'm an institutional investor, it's a very different value proposition, right? This is a positively skewed distribution. You know, the ta- the right tail, you know, goes far out to the right. There, right? There's more dispersion, right? There's more uh, volatility in the outcome, but overall, the risk is actually very low, right? So, right, this is gambling. This is a strategy, right? And to drive home that point, um, that right, you know, just we we look at the probability, right, of you know a positive return on the right is a strategy, on the left is a is is worse than a coin flip. And by the way, right, this sample right here is three thousand six hundred thirty one companies, right? The the last twenty years of IPOs. I wish I could have data for the last three years because that would be interesting as well, but I don't. And another interesting thing to highlight, right, is the stabilization, right? And we're we're I'm gonna talk about the mechanics about that in a second, but at the 30 day mark, right? Um, first of all, right, this is the one on the left, right? That's that's your cumulative return um from the opening price I should say opening price but you will notice still right that this is a pretty narrow distribution right so it's actually it's controlled right price is controlled to an extent it's a lot more controlled um from the uh offer price right because essentially what a bank is going to want to do is they're going to want to defend you know, once the stock opens, they're going to want to make sure that the open price holds, right? But that's their secondary um, secondary job, right? To protect the investors. Num- number one, or yeah, the number one goal, right, is to make sure that the offer price doesn't break, right? So ARM IPO at 51, and, you know, I think it went to like maybe even 60 on the first day. The goal is for it to not go below 51 because then everyone that invested in ARM for the IPO is going to be underwater. And so then when the next IPO comes around and you're going to go to the same investors and you're going to say, hey, would you be willing to invest in these IPOs? They're going to say, absolutely not, because I lost money on the last one, right? If you can almost guarantee them that they're going to make money, then they're going to be much more willing participants, right? So again, we have a much wider distribution. It is still slightly positively skewed and the tail, right, goes out into the right um, versus, you know, a more narrow distribution, but, you know, the mean is pretty much at zero versus, you know, fairly positive here. And when I compare this, right, to day 180, the distribution becomes more normal. Right, so we go back, we can see how you got a much more normal distribution. And the reason why I'm comparing day 30 to day 180 is because banks are allowed to stabilize the IPO price for the first 30 days only. So after that, right, it's more you know market driven uh, price action, right, or only market driven price action in that in that regard. And again, you know, to the right is a positively skewed distribution with a, you know, nice right tail. And the real difference is, right, is that 15 to 30 percent cushion that the IPO investor got. Right. So it really is favorable to these investors. And if we even expanded 
to even a more long-term horizon, right? This is looking at all IPOs from 1980 to 2021. Sample size is around like 9,000 or, you know, we have data on 6,000 IPOs. What this professor did here, he compared the returns, right, of IPOs versus um, companies of similar size and similar uh, valuation as well. So he looked at, uh, I think, book market value, something like that. But essentially, pretty much at every single point, uh, you know, the IPOs are underperforming companies of similar size, right? And and, and it's important that, right, that we're comparing. We're not comparing type. We're comparing size, right? Because companies IPO at a specific point, right, in their lifetime, for very specific reasons, which we'll get into in a moment. Right. But, you know, this kind of lays it out really well here, right. And so you, you, you underperform, and you underperform because, right, IPOs are a high product, right. So, and again, if you, you know, subtract that 15 to 30, or you add that 15 to 30%, right? That makes all the difference, right? So while the institutions can actually make money on this, you cannot. That that's kind of the gist of it on a you know on a very high sample size. But don't worry, we we do have trading strategies that will help you tackle this and actually make money. But first, right, we're gonna go, we're kind of gonna go through here step by step. And again, while I'm going through this, I, I challenge you to try and just think about you know, how you would monetize this, how you would trade this. And then I'll propose some strategies at the end, right? So, you know, as I said, you know, companies IPO for specific reasons at a specific time in their lifespan. And it's usually at this time right here, right? When they're still, you know, mar maybe marginally profitable. Most of them are not profitable. They're raising money in order to fund their growth and you know typically this will coincide right with the peak of their valuation right because when they finally start to mature right their growth will slow and the company will be less appealing right what would you rather invest in right the sexy high growth tech stock right <laughs> or you know the mature company and you know, this is why they IPO at this time as well, right? It's a time, there's a timing aspect to it, right? It's much easier to IPO, right? A company in its prime, there's going to be a lot more demand for it, right? Than, you know, a company that has no growth prospects. And interestingly, right now, what the banks are doing is, you know, the first IPOs that are coming out now are some of the more high quality IPOs, right? Because they want to kick off the return of the IPO window, you know, with at a, at a at a strong start, right? And so, actually, you know, anecdotally, you know, I know that some bankers are telling some companies that want to IPO right now. They're telling them, "You're not ready, like the you know, like you you're not either growing quickly enough, or you're not profitable enough, or you know, if, whatever the case is." it's too much risk to for them to you know tell you yes we can raise money for you and so right when we look at the trends here um you know the number of tech stocks ipoing the number of unprofitable companies ipoing has been increasing and in 2022 right there are substantially a lot less ipos but you know for those that were here you know in 2020 2021 it's actually kind of crazy to see this chart because, you know, look at what was going on in 1999, 2000. We, we weren't even close right, to, to that. But, you know, it's more and more unprofitable companies um, going public. And, right, so this is the distribution of returns, right, between tech and non-tech and unprofitable and profitable, right? Surprisingly, you'll see that you know, the unprofitable, the exciting companies that are so appealing or, or you know, they'll let your imagination run wild, you know, get more people to buy in on the first day. And, 
you know, this is just a good example here, right? You know, you know, this person looked at 37 software companies that IPO'd in like 2021, 2020. And right, there's certain, um, you know, uh, benchmarks, right, that or things that they have kind of in common, right. And, um, you know, this is a bunch of software metrics here, right. But, you know, again, it's like the high growth stage, where you're going kind of towards profitability where there's a light at the end of the tunnel and this is the optimal time right for you to raise capital and one thing that's important to do when you're investing or swinging or trading an ipo is knowing where the money is going to go to right so if you open up a s1 Essentially, you'll be able to find it, right? And S1, again, is the document that companies uh, file with the SEC in order to go public. And they're going to tell you what they're going to use the money that they raise for, right? So this is Airbnb. They're going to be using it, right? To, they're going to reinvest it back in, into the company, essentially, is what they're saying. Same with Datadog, right? And again, anecdotal, but those two IPOs worked out very well. We have Arm here. And they file an F1 because it's a foreign company, they say, right, we will not receive any proceeds and it's actually going to go all to SoftBank, right? So SoftBank actually is the, you know, 100% owner of Arm, right? And they floated 10% of the available shares, right? And so none of that money went to Arm, right? And again, Arm is, is a great company. You can think of it whatever you want, but at the end of the day, like, their main benefit in this IPO is kind of actually the marketing, right? That they got and, um, but you know now there's a you know publicly traded stock with their with their name on it. Bumble, a lot of people traded this one. Um, again, this was owned by actually a private equity firm, and essentially the money, some of the money went to right. Um, paying off their debt and some of it went to paying off pre-IPO owners. So again, it didn't get, or at least like, right. It, it essentially did not reinvest, right. This money back into its growth and right. Ideally you'd want the company to be raising money to be able to grow, right. Because that's going to drive your capital appreciation. And there was a study done on, on, you know, kind of the importance of this by UVA. Um, what they did was they looked at companies that were owned by, you know, a private equity company or right some major investor where the money went from the investor or fr from, you know, people investing in the IPO, not to the company, but to the private equity firm or right, whatever investor owned that company. And, right, essentially, there's a period after the IPO where they can't really get rid of, you know, a large period of shares. So then they actually end up, you know, selling out the rest of their stake, right? This private equity firm that owns, I don't know, Bumble, for example, they're going to be dumping shares at the market at, you know, irregular intervals whenever the stock is high slowly trying to scale out of an absolutely massive position, right? So SoftBank is going to be uh, type exhibit A of this, where what SoftBank is doing is, right, so they still own 90% of ARM. Whenever they need money, they're going to be selling some of that ARM stake. And they're going to, and, right, they're going to be dumping the stock because they're going to be placing like 2 billion, 3 billion, you know, dollars in, 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 in shares, right. On the market all at once. Right. So it's going to make it tough actually for, for, for that stock to go up. And it is really annoying. Right. I, you know, I follow some companies that are owned by sponsors and sometimes it can take a very long time, right. For that selling pressure to evaporate and even if the company is good um the upside you know is limited when there's so much selling pressure on a stock so if you're investing or swinging an ipo i do recommend right taking a look into this and usually 
um, online. You can probably find the name of, you know, the top 10 shareholders. If you see like a private equity firm there, or, I don't know, a major concentration, you know, in one single investor, this is something that you have to worry about. Okay, so in the example of ARM, right, they want to go public, you know, it's the right time, um, essentially, or it's not even the right time, uh, you know, SoftBank wants them to go public, right, they're going to hire a whole slew of different financial institutions or investment banks, right, they're going to help them, right, with every single aspect of that process. And it was actually 28 different companies that were helping them out. Um, and so, you know, th these are kind of the key roles here. Right? There's going to be one that's just going to be kind of taking care of ARM and making sure that, you know, all the other companies essentially, right, aren't screwing them over, uh, you know, by acting in their self-interest. They're going to have, uh, you know, bankers that are going to, um, you know, help with the valuation, help with the trading, helping line up investors, you know, determining how much they all get. And then they're also going to have one of the banks that's right going to be uh, essentially, you know, stabilizing the share price. And we'll get to that in a moment. Okay. And so when a company is being priced, right? So, you know, this is how it so started with SoftBank, right? You know, they start talking to investors and, right, the bankers, right, who, you know, they want as, as high of a valuation as possible, right? Because they're going to get fees and their client is going to be, as you know, happier. They can give away less of the company to raise the same amount of money. And then there's the investors, right? who are saying, look, like it's only worth $40 million because it's in their incentive to pay as little as possible, right? To get the most upside as possible, right? So again, it's a tug of war um, in this scenario, right? But really it's, uh, you know, it's a supply and demand equation. And um, so again, these are the 37 companies we saw earlier. Essentially um, what this is saying is like, you know, they on average went public at a 20% discount to their peers, right? Because they, they, you know, the investors have to get that discount um, in order to go, uh, you know, in order to want to invest. And once, right, these conversations start, right, that's when the marketing really kicks off, right? You get the S1 published. And again, it's a marketing document, right? It's, they want you to buy their stock. And so the one section that's really not a marketing section is the risk section. And that I recommend reading all the time. Um, the perspective is always going to give you um, right ways to think about the company and you know favorable forms of right analyzing the company. But the risk section, right, is what, Usually, right, they're legally right required to try and be as transparent as possible. And ARM actually had some pretty interesting uh, disclosures. And then the other thing that's going to happen is every time, right, so they're going to have a price range. And as that price range moves up, um, the they're going to have to refile, right? So every time the price range increases by more than 20%, they're going to have to file another S1. And uh, actually on JS's news filter uh, website, you can actually see when these S1s are filed. And so it's a good idea to keep track of it just to see how the demand um, is right for the company. If, if the price range is constantly moving up, then, you know, things are going to, you know, it, it's more likely to succeed, right? than not and part of the marketing right is that they do meet right with you know all of these hedge funds this is what happened with arm right they got a hundred of the world's biggest hedge funds in a hotel room and then they pumped up pumped the stock to them they trotted out bill Huang to say yeah you know arm is a sick product and right essentially you know try and get them to you know, increase their valuations of ARM. And 
right? This is, you know, hype is really a key component, right? It cannot, it, there's a reason why there's no IPOs, right? In down markets, right? There's only IPOs in, in, in bull markets. And right, that's because, right, it, there kind of has to be a greater fool, right? Like there have to be speculator people to sell to, right? So if there isn't enough hype, then um, that's not going to happen. But if there is, there's going to be a demand and supply imbalance. The price is going to go up. The investors are going to be satisfied. And the banks are going to be, it's going to be that much easier, right, to sell the next IPO because they're going to say, hey, look, like we, you know, we offered, right, uh, you know, this last IPO and you all made money. So, you know, if you want to make money on the next one, hop in, right? And it becomes that much easier. And you should really look at all of them, right, from a demand supply equation, right? And that's because there has to be one trade, right? Uh, when, you know, when the IPO is priced, right, it's priced at one trade, right? So arm went public at $51, right? That means every single investor that invested in the IPO paid exactly $51, for shares of arm right and so what will happen is you know bankers don't really know right what that price is going to be right so based on the levels of demand right they're going to say right like you know they're going to find the price where this company can raise the exact amount of money that they want um and so in this example, right, if a company wants to raise 500 million and right at $18 a share, it can raise 375 million and at 700 million, it can raise 15, right? It's going to price at 15 and sell 500 million, right? Because that's the, that's the sure thing. And, and the bank is on the hook, right? The bank guarantees that, you know, these shares will sell, right? So you know, it, they have to be conservative to an extent as well. And so, as I mentioned, right, tracking the S1 amendments, um, right, that's important. Um, tracking the delta, right, you know, how, how much higher than the IPO price did it open, right? So Airbnb opening at 147 when it went public at uh, 65, right? That's a great indicator of, you know, too much demand, right? You should be, you know, biased to the long side. You should be tracking, right? How capital intensive, right? This company is, right? So there is, there are some companies that have lots of funding rounds, right? Before an IPO, others that have maybe just one, right? So if, if a company doesn't go, you know, uh, doesn't raise money very often, then the value of your shares will be just that much more because the risk of more being created will be lower, right? So if there's less shares in circulation, right, your shares are worth more. And you'll also see, you know, them trying to pump IPOs, right, through the news, you know, and they're going to say they're oversubscribed, aka, like, you know, there's more demand for this IPO than, you know, we can actually satisfy. Um, you know, that's usually just a leak, right, from the bank. So um, it's not really something to look into. And again, right, um, just to show green line is the, you know, IPOs that open or the, num the share of IPOs, right, that open above range. And, right, obviously that coincides with greater IPO returns and it coincides with bull markets. And, right, we before we were seeing that, you know, these 37 companies went public at a around 20% discount to to you know their peers and this was the delta right of the um so so uh, so this is actually a different uh, uh, message here essentially right you know they re revise their price up from the initial price range around 20% right on average right so if you have a company that's being revised more than uh, others, right, or the price range is much higher than where it initially priced, it might do a lot better, right, than um, other companies. And actually, I think that turned out pretty well, right, for, for the companies right here. 
um, right? If we're looking at the supply and demand equation, um, we can see that the float, right, percentage um, has been decreasing, right? So less and less shares have been offered, right, as a percentage of outstanding shares that company has, right? So if the su supply is smaller, right, there's going to be more volatility. There's a more greater likelihood that the price is going to pop. And and for an extreme example, um, I know a lot of people here traded and uh, heard of VinFast, right? VFS. Uh, this was around in like, you know, I think July or August, right? It was a D SPAC. And, you know, this company went, you know, I think it was up like at least like 200, 300% at, at, one, at one point. It's actually not a good company. We we actually talked about this on at, on UT. It's not it's not a good company, right? They're losing 1.5 billion in cash a year. They're absolutely going to have to raise money in the future. But what they did was they out of 2.3 billion shares, they only made 7 million shares public, right? So it was much easier for the you know, there was much more upside, right, in the stock because there was much more demand than there was supply, right? And it was just because it was just such a small percentage of the float. So make sure that you are you look out for that. If it's a very small percentage of the float, then, right, there's going to be a lot of volatility in the stock, right? Because it's not going to take a lot of volume, right, to, to move the stock. And so, right, when we're thinking about, right, how investors get allocation, right? Again, it's all with this goal of getting that 15 to 30% pop. So you have to combine all these different, um, you know, inv types of investors, right? You have to take into account, right, the rules of who can sell, who cannot. You have to take into account, right, how many shares are going to be offered. And you need to combine all that to figure out a way in that, right, the stock will be up 15 to 30 percent and obviously that's very hard so a lot of times they overshoot or undershoot right and there's actually always you know a lot of debate on whether you know they were right or wrong in their valuation and you know bankers are always going to court right is it because you know there is a lot of you know lee uh you know i guess leeway to it and um, one thing that's been very popular, right, is getting these cornerstone investors, right? So, you know, where you, the majority IPO goes to a few major players, right? And they, it's kind of a handshake agreement where they're like, look, we're not going to sell. And so now what happens is that even a smaller portion of the IPO is available to be freely traded, right? So you could have the price, you know, squeezing even higher right and um it was interesting because on the instacart ipo actually right there weren't enough uh you know smaller investors on the ipo so when the stock started dropping there was no one there to actually buy it <laughs> because the cornerstone investors right they have a big position they don't want to uh right like they're they're long-term holders they're not here to trade this in and out so it needs to be a combination right? the big investors, the small investors, the uh, hedge funds, the long onlys. And that's really right. Their goal. Right. And as I said, right, if there's a big retail allocation, uh, that's usually not a great sign. Um, right. Cause that means the institutions uh, weren't interested. And this is a quote from the unity uh, CEO, right. That stock, IPO at like eighty six dollars and ended up running to like one eighty, um, and right they they basically got to hand pick right who who the investors were, and this is an actual uh, order book. It's in an Excel spreadsheet um, for an actual software IPO, right? So right investor one right essentially would say I'm willing to buy X amount at this price. Y amount at this price, Z amount at th that price, right? And they get an idea, right, of how much they would be willing to buy, the percentage of the deal that is. And that's how they 
build the book. And this is, uh, I'm actually guessing, right? Marketplace IPO. I think this is big, big C right here. Um, sa sa same story, right? Um, you know, here they had smaller allocations. Um, and I guess the stock was a lot more volatile as a result, right? Because um, there, there's less um, major holders in a sense, right? That are just kind of, they, you, you kind of have a handshake agreement with saying that, right? They're not going to just flip the stock on the first day. And, right, this is how, right, the allocation gets decided. And one thing that happens, right, is these large investors, for the first thing, is they only get a small portion right of the allocation so right they're gonna you know want to you know get it as cheaply as possible because then they're gonna have to buy you know the rest of what they want in the open market so they're gonna try and uh you know submit very low orders and same with hedge funds right because you know obviously the lower price you get they it, that's just the you know straight gains right to you and um that said right like actually interestingly enough right if there's an ipo coming up you'll notice right it doesn't start trading on 9 30 it starts trading whenever a market can be made and in fact um right that's when you know everyone that's not an ipo investor enters right their limit orders and actually you can enter your limit orders um you know into your broker as well before it starts trading at different prices and um right when it goes live right you either get will get filled or you won't and um so the major institutions right like they actually have a lot of power and so they're gonna try and ask for larger allocations and you know the lowest price possible in order to right get the best deal that they possibly can right and so you know actually right i guess sometimes right they will even ask 10 times more than they want um right and so then you get the over over subscription right and you know there's a obviously a risk to the investment banks this was on a fall on morgan stanley um took a loss when actually like the they couldn't find enough investors to right invest in the fall on so they were the ones that ended up holding the bag and i haven't seen this happen very recently but this is definitely something that happens um okay answering the question of why is the open price different from the ipo price right you should almost be able to answer that now but right essentially it's a very different price at which a market can be made versus the one which you know this excel spreadsheet of investors agreed to the prior day right and so you know if there until there is a balance between buyers and sellers right um that's you know it's not gonna it's not gonna trade and there has to be and, and the opening trade is just that right an opening trade right so just because an airbnb opens at 147 dollars a share doesn't mean it's actually worth $147 a share, right? That That's just the price at which it traded at, at that open, right? So um, that's kind of the the story there. And, you know, if it, you know, they took a look at a bunch of IPOs, right? Usually the opening trade, right, is only like 20% of the actual IPO size, right? So you already have a small amount of shares, right? A small percentage of the company, and now, you know, the opening price is decided based on, right, 20% of the public shares, right? So, you know, that's why, you know, the initial period of price discovery is very volatile, right, for IPOs, right? Because essentially, right, like, they're, they're just being priced on, you know, by a small number of participants, right? And, you know, there's a pretty clear trend here, right? The more actually that the flow turns over, um, the greater the gains, right? So the more supply, demand, and balance there will be. And 
needs, right? So, you know, actually, you might that's something that you might be interested in as a trader. You might be looking for IPOs with a smaller float. And, right, as an illustration, right, like, you know, it's just such a small percent of the ownership, right, that actually trades on the opening day, right? So that's why there's just so much uh, volatility, right? So I'm going to keep going here in the interest of time, right? But, um, right, a key key point is, right, and it's this last bullet point right here is that the stocks, uh, the IPOs have to stay above the IPO price, not not the opening price, the IPO price, um, in order to for it to be a profitable business, right? For you know, or for it to be an enticing business, right? For for the companies, for the investors, for the banks, right? And so there is a tool part of every single IPO that you know serves to make that happen. It's called the green shoe. And essentially, if a company is issuing 100 million shares, what the bank will do is they will take orders for 115 million shares, right? So they will offer 15 million more shares than is like than there actually are, right? So if they all sell, then the bank is essentially short 15 million shares right but that's why they have this essentially call option which is called the green shoe that will allow them to get 15 million shares at the ipo price right thereby hedging their short right so the way this works is that if the ipo price goes up um right the comp uh, the bank is right net short 15 million shares they're just going to exercise um, right their call option and get 15 million at right the IPO price, and that's going to allow them to break even on their short. If the um, if the you know price IPO price goes down, uh, or or the share price goes down, uh, you know the now the bank is profitable right on that short. And what they'll start doing is they'll start buying, right? Closing that short. And in and what they'll do, right, is one, they'll make money on the short. And two, they're going to be supporting the price, right? By being able to buy right below the the strike price, right? And that that's what they do. And they can do that for 30 days after the IPO. And so that's kind of, you know, a stabilizing, stabilizing floor. And, you know, this was a study done on Facebook's IPO. Essentially, what people noticed was the depth. Um, there was a lot, you know, the, the bid size, right, throughout the order book was a lot higher at certain prices, right? In this case, it was 38 bucks. And that's where um, Facebook, you know, IPO'd at. Um, and what was interesting was actually that, uh, right, Facebook stock ended up tanking, right? Um, but, and Morgan Stanley actually took a loss on this because they actually started buying at like 40 bucks because right their goal actually isn't to make money on the short their goal is to keep the price up right so if it opened around like 41 uh their goal right is and you know they identify 40 as a key level they're going to try and support 40 even if their right break even price on their shorts is 38 right so they actually took a 66 million dollar loss on trying to stabilize the facebook ipo because right they wanted to support investors right who paid 38 dollars a share and then wouldn't be so keen on investing in another ipo if they were underwater on this one and so again right they were buying at 40 right and you could see it on the bid and you could see it at 38 on the bid and that's what uh right investors uh you know and you know that's something that you could play off of right like that's an opportunity for you as a trader and we're gonna you know go through some 
examples of that. We're going to take a quick five minute break. We've been going for almost an hour, 20 minutes here. So let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back, finish off this lesson. All right, I'm back. So thank you for you know, everyone who's still hanging with us. Uh, hopefully it'll be a, a more digestible format. Um, you know, if, if it's on YouTube that way, you can pause or skip around whenever you want. But all right, so let's just go through a green shoe example right here. Um, right, so this is what happened with ARM, right? So they went public at $51, 10% of their shares or 7% of the shares right, that they issued. Um, on top of that was the green shoe, right? So they have 1 billion shares total, 95 million is what became public. And there are 7 million more shares, right, that JP Morgan will be buying to support the stock, right? It's it's pretty simple. And you can find this online for whatever IPO you want. You can just, you know, read the press release um, that will say the, the price that it went public at. And then essentially, right, uh, the number of, shares right it's called over allotments that's the green shoe right so if you're right if you're trading an ipo right um you're not investing you're trading you're, you're scalping you are being nimble right typically there can be trending right that's what i've seen the most um where if if an IPO right pops substantially, right you you're gonna want to try and go long on a pullback. If an IPO you know breaks its opening price, you're gonna want to be probably short biased right and trying to trade that trend. Uh, but the easiest money will be made right around the offer price, and I'm gonna show you some examples of exactly right how how you can do that. And scalp law, right can suit you pretty well as well right um you'll see that the you know initial moves right are the biggest and then that range is gonna slowly get smaller and the price is gonna stabilize especially right towards the end of the first day um when swing trading right and even um day trading it on the very first day just because the price can be so volatile like you're essentially gonna be you know buying at very different uh, valuations in in a very short period of time right so and we're going to go through an example of this right but essentially when you're setting limits right before the ipo starts trading you're going to want to send you know submit those limit orders at prices at which you're okay with owning right the ipo right so valuations that you are okay with right because there's no support and resistance levels, right? So, you know, that's tough, right? And unless you want, right, for a range to be set, then you literally have no range to trade, right? So that's why valuation can actually be pretty important. And then you're going to want to keep in mind, right, that there's this stabilization period of the 30 days. Then there's at 180 days, right, you get the lockup expiry. And so, right, usually there's a negative, there's a selling pressure kind of into um the lockup expiry so you want to keep that in mind and also um, around 25 days out that's when research starts to get published so for arm for example um some uh some research firm published a report about you know demand for semiconductors and why they were bearish on arm and that actually um tanked the stock uh on that day so uh, just be mindful mindful of that, right? And if you're wondering when options start trading um, since July 2023, if the market cap is greater than $3 billion, they start trading on the second business day after the IPO day. So actually, right, if you want to go short, uh, you can, on, you know, there's not going to be a lot of liqu liquidity, right? And it's going to be very risky. But if you do want to go short and there's, probably typically going to be no shares to borrow. You can actually uh, write underwrite uh, calls. 
And this is how we have done the evaluation at UT. Actually, you know, Trey Mack, I don't think he's around anymore, but he did this constantly for pretty much all the IPOs that we traded. Um, and it's actually, it looks complicated, but it's really not, right? So if you just follow my laser pointer, I will guide you through this. So first of all, right, when, you know, this is on facts at, uh, I don't know you you might you should be able to find like that on yahoo finance right the valuation multiples for you know comparative companies right so if we're looking at arm we're looking at nvidia we're looking at amd intel asml uh amat and we're seeing right at what multiple they're trading and we can absolutely derive the multiple at every price of arm right and remember we don't know where arm is going to open so we look at the valuation for each price and so what we did here right is essentially we calculated the enterprise value which i'm not going to get into how to do i think we did this in the in our dcf lesson so you can always go back and watch that if, if you're interested in in it but essentially the company said uh, we expect revenues to grow at a 20% clip in the next year. And um, then we make an assumption, right? Maybe they grow 20% the next year as well, right? And then we come up with the multiple, right? Which is the enterprise value divided by the revenue, right? Essentially, how many dollars are you willing to pay per dollar of revenue that ARM generates, right? So if we just follow right this line right here, 2025, where we assume two years of 20% revenue increases, this is the multiple that you get, right? And so, you know, if you guys are familiar with the price earnings multiple, right, that's how much are you paying per dollar of earnings, essentially, right? So we are valuing ARM, right? Because, you know, we expect it to grow, so we value it based on sales, right? And so here, if it opens at 44, it's trading at 11 times, um, right? If it, I, I can't, I can't actually can't see the numbers that it says here because of the zoom overlay, but um, essentially, right? Like, you know, if we look at 12 X right here, right? Which looks like it could be uh, you know, 50, 51. All right, that's where NVIDIA is trading. So you ask yourself, right? Am I okay with paying as much for NVIDIA or for ARM as I am for NVIDIA? And it probably would be no for most people, right? But if it falls to 44, uh, you know, then you're actually at, at a pretty significant discount to something like NVIDIA. And this is probably where, you know, it actually makes sense to buy it, right? Because... Um, it doesn't have the same growth as NVIDIA because it doesn't have the same exposure to AI as NVIDIA. And right, therefore, it shouldn't be worth as much as NVIDIA, right? But if you do this exercise, right, you know exactly how much you're paying at every single valuation. And uh, this was September 23rd. So, um, you know, I'm sure these multiples are much higher, right, at this point. But Right, this gives you an idea, right, of what you're buying and how much you're paying and what value you're getting for what you're buying. And you know, something else that you could do, right, is trade the earnings, right? Essentially, no company should miss uh, after, you know, in the first four quarters after an IPO, right? Because, um, right, they spend so much time, right, with research analysts, right, setting expectations, consulting with bankers, right? They should have a very good idea, right, of, you know, what they can uh, right, accomplish, right, in their first year and set expectations just below that, right, so that they could surprise. And so actually, right, if they, if they surprise three out of four quarters, but even one is in line with uh, right, expectations, their stock is not rewarded at all, right? If they miss just one quarter, they are punished severely for this, right? Um, likewise, uh, or, you know, alternatively, right? 
you know, if they perform well, right, they, they tend to be rewarded for that. And so it's a pretty small sample here, but, you know, trading the earnings, right, of a recently IPO company does present, you know, an, an upside opportunity. I think ARM dipped on their earnings, even though they didn't really miss. I think there was just some like bearish commentary there and, you know, the stock, you know, the stock was down like 6% on the day, but then and then ended up recovering that, right? So if you, you know, have these stats in mind, right, you would be, and you know what valuation you're paying, you would probably be on the bullish side, right, on ARM. This was a, a Swedish study. I don't know why it's in Sweden, but they looked at, you know, how stock prices perform, uh, you know, before lockup expiration, right? And typically, right, as you would expect, when insiders are able to start selling, you know, stocks sell off, right, both into that and afterwards, right? So um, I remember, right, when, you know, it was IPO season, we were tracking these IPO lockups, expiries, right? And so that's very important. It's 100 days out. So make sure to keep that in mind. And usually you want to prepare yourself for this trade, like about a week or two in advance, where you're kind of on the short side because again everyone is going to be thinking the same way they're going to be like oh like lockup expiry coming up we should sell out we should short and you know sometimes the stock will actually bottom when uh, the lockup expires because like that's already you know ha has been priced in so this is a you know we finally got some trading charts so you know everyone that got stuck in here <laughs> um hopefully you you actually <laughs> Uh, enjoy this but uh, this was the arm ipo um, right it popped on the first day and you know there was a pretty major uh sell-off right uh, um you know subsequently after and again this is why i would say like play the trend right um because you know downwards pressure will drive more downwards pressure right um if you're if you invest in an ipo you're up 20 to 30 percent right away and all of a sudden right um you know this this the stock starts coming down you're just going to want to take your profits right and that that's what tends to happen so there it does tend to uh be you, you know have streaks and you can actually like i like to track the obv right on balance volume here and you can see like there is a pretty significant amount of volume right that came down here and then the other thing that i will say right is like look where the vpoc is right it's exactly at 51 around 51 dollars right? and there's polarity right around that 51 level right so that's something that you could absolutely trade like both rejections all right and uh you know as a rejection or a support level right then multiple multiple times right um that trade works right and and you know, your, your kind of, your risk is to the upside, especially because, you know, below that 51 price, right, you have, you know, a bank buying, buying shares, right. And when, you know, we look at, you know, you know, what's happened since, right, obviously, the market has substantially recovered. Uh, but, you know, that 51 price, you know, there were so many opportunities for you to capitalize right on that. And that's that blue line right there. Right, that acted as a support level so many times. And what's interesting to me, right, is if you look at the OBV, there's actually a bearish or, or there's actually a divergence here, right? So we went up on a lot less volume, right, to get to the same price than where we were, right? There's actually a ton of selling pressure, right? So, you know, the bank stops buying around the 30 day mark right but it is interesting to me right that once the dust settles um like you can get a like a nice move you know a nice trend like this on relatively low volume right because i think that there's probably a lot of institutions trying to still you know that who didn't get all the allocation they wanted right you know trying to lo load up on the stock and they end up uh moving it up and this is Instacart, um, similar story, I guess, as Arm, where, you know, came down pretty heavily below IPO. Um, I think it IPO'd at 
thirty dollars, right? That's where this blue line is. So this is, you know, this is like a five minute charge here. Look at that support level. Like that is just absolutely perfect. Like you guys should be making money on this every single day of the week, right? I mean, it's just easy, e easy trades, right? And you just play it, play it, play the range or play the 30 support level. And, you know, you make the quick scalps and, and eventually that 30 level broke, right? And you have some polarity, right? At this 30 level, we rejected off of it. And now the price is just sitting at like $24. And my thinking is that, right? Like, you know, this was within a 30 day period where the bank could buy, right? So you had this, um, you know, support level get created and it's literally just been stuck here for, for 30 days. And imagine how much scalping can be done back and forth here um, in this range, right? For days, you can be scalping for days. And this is Birkenstock, uh, $46 was the IPO price. You know, there's actually not many IPOs that open below their IPO price. So there was a lot of like controversy around that. But um, again, the polarity, um, you know, you could have played 46 kind of, you know, as a pullback, you know, I think it went to like 47, 48, right? So, you know, this was a good setup, um, right? If you, you have an uptrend, right? You wait for the pullback to the uh, IPO price and, you know, go along. And similarly, like, uh, you know, some people play round numbers, right? 40, even like, where you just play like, you know, whole numbers, right? Um, there is that like psych uh, element, right? Of psychology in, uh, in, in trading these IPOs. This is a, a software IPO it, it recently, like in the last few months. Again, this thirty dollars is where it priced, and I mean this this gave you so many good setups to go along, um, right? And then flip short, uh, short the rejection after that broke. Um, it does break over it once or twice, right? But um, and then it starts you just get a nice range right around this uh, 30 price. Right. So it's, it's, it is pretty predictable in that, in that regard. Um, Ken view was like one of the first IPOs uh, of, of this season, right. That 22 where it, you know, kind of uh, bounced right above it once or twice. And then once it broke, retested it and sold off. Right. So, you know, that's a setup, right? That, um, you know, you can, you can count on. And so, uh, the question is, right. Is the IPO market going to come back? Um, right. You know, it's really been dead for the last year and a half, but, um, you know, if these IPOs stay up, like you're going to definitely see a lot more IPOs, um, coming out. And yeah, this was the wealth destruction that you had um you know happen but we'll see we'll see what happens with the ipo market and so that's pretty much it um everyone that hung in thank you appreciate it happy to answer any questions otherwise uh catch us on youtube and also feel free to circle around with any questions uh on ut and uh, yeah, hope, hope, hopefully it's useful and would also be happy just to hear how anyone else might tr trade these IPOs.